Today, we'll be taking a look at one of the most important but controversial theories in finance, the efficient market hypothesis. I'm joined by Dr. Frank Hollenbeck to discuss this theory and what it means in the forecasting of exchange rates. Hi, Dr. Frank. Thank you for joining us today. Hello. Firstly, Dr. Frank, could I ask you to briefly outline this theory for us? Well, first, it is by far the most important theory in finance. I think anyone, and I mean anyone who has a position in finance, should be familiar with the efficient market hypothesis and its implications. Let me give you a simple example. Suppose that you have two stocks. You have Apple and you have IBM and they're both trading at $100. And for the level of risk, you need to be able to have 10% to hold either one of these stocks. Now, suppose it's the morning and you've gotten out of bed, you've gotten your coffee, you've gotten your uh, newspaper, and uh, you have your Wall Street Journal, and you look it up and you see on the first page that um, IBM has just landed a phenomenal contract in uh, China. And uh, according to uh, leading analysts, uh, they expect that earnings will be much higher and that the stock price will be $200 at the end of the year. Now, suppose the market opens, uh, would you buy it at 100, knowing that you, it's gonna go to 200 and you only need 10%? Yeah. Why yeah, not? you would. But the problem is, is so would everybody else. And the problem is nobody would be selling because they only need 10% to hold it. So what would happen is the stock price would go immediately from 100 to 181.81. And you're going to say, why 181.81? The reason is, is that the difference between 181.81 and $200 is exactly 10%. Now, suppose that uh, you pick up this newspaper and on the second page, you find out that Apple had a major uh, plant in China burned down. And uh, the same analysts estimate that because it's burned down, its uh, production of iPods is going to go way down and that they estimate the price to be $50 by the end of the year, okay? So if you had Apple at $100, would you try to sell it for $100, knowing that it's gonna go to $50 in a year from now? Yeah. Yeah, you try to sell it. The problem is, is everybody would try to sell and nobody would buy. So what would happen is the stock price will fall from 100 to 45.45. Now you're going to say, why 45.45? The reason is, is because between 45.45 and $50 is exactly 10%. Now here's the question. The market opens, okay, and you have a choice. You can either buy Apple or you can buy IBM. Which one would you purchase? I'm going to go for the riskier one and go Apple. So you're going to go for Apple. Most <laughs> of my students, 75% of my students say IBM and only 25% say Apple. The answer is, it doesn't matter. Both of them will give you 10%. In other words, knowing the information did not give you an advantage. In other words, what happened is that the information was reflected in the stock price. And because it was reflected in the stock price, you could not make abnormal returns from knowing this information. Okay, that's the key to the efficient market hypothesis. Now from that, we can draw many conclusions. The first one is that markets have no memory. Okay, what does that mean? That means that when we look at price, it incorporates all past and public information and anticipations into the future. So that means that the prices follow what we call a random walk. In other words, the price we have today only depends on unanticipated events into the future, which means that it's going to be random. In other words, the movement of the stock price is going to be random. That has enormous implications because it means that knowing the past is not useful. In other words, uh, basically the conclusion is, is that technical analysis is somewhat useless. Okay? That's the first implication, is that uh, prices follow a random walk. The second uh, important implication is that you can trust market prices. In other words, you, you have the correct price when you look at the price of IBM. You're not paying too much, you're not paying too little, you're paying just the right price because the price incorporates all of the important information. Also, another thing is, is that price tells you things about the future because the anticipations of the future are going to be reflected in the price. Okay, those are the important things uh, to remember. Okay, now um, we have had a uh, enormous amount of uh, tests of uh, 
the efficient market hypothesis. Uh, the first type of tests that we've had are what we call the autocorrelation tests. And uh, what they do is uh, they look at what happened yesterday. And for example, if the stock price went up yesterday, does that mean it's more or less likely to go up or down the following day? And in the case of the autocorrelation tests, and they've done many tests, uh, for example, they've done it on Microsoft, or they've done it on Sony, or they've done it on BP. And what they found is that there's essentially no relationship between what happened yesterday and what will happen today. So in other words, prices are not influenced by what happened in the past. Okay? The second type of test uh, basically tests a technical analysis. And technical analysis, uh, they looked at trading rules, and they looked at uh, a variety of trading rules. They looked at trading rules built based on a filter, where the filter was set between 5 and 50%. And they found that uh, the trading, uh, they found trading rules and uh, technical analysis did not do better. Uh, the empirical studies have shown that it did not do better than just having a um, buy and hold strategy. Okay. Now, a lot of technical analysis have criticized these studies because they said that only the simplest trading rules were used and that a lot of these studies didn't take into account some of the subjective aspects of uh, technical trading. Uh, there's another very large category of uh, tests that were done on what I call anomalies. And uh, there, for example, there's the January anomaly in the sense that uh, the market tends to go down in December and go back up in January. And we've had other uh, anomalies such as what we call the weekend or Monday effects. And we've had anomaly studies done uh, looking at low price earnings ratio stocks against high price earnings ratios, ratio stocks or small capitalization stocks against large capitalization stocks or stocks with um, low book to book value to market value ratios relative to um, high book value to market value ratios or price earnings growth ratios all of these are the anomaly studies and the basic idea is that if you have an anomaly you can make an abnormal return so for example if the stock price goes up in January then what you should do is you should buy in December and sell at the end of January and therefore you should be able to make an abnormal return um, I have something to say about these anomaly studies. Uh, let me give you an example. Uh, suppose that you take 100 analysts, okay? And uh, you ask them to flip a coin, you ask them to, the flip of a, you ask them to find the uh, solution to flipping a coin five times. In other words, you flip a coin five times and you ask them to predict the flip of the coin, whether it's uh, heads or tails. Now, uh, what statistical theory tells you, what statistical theory tells you is that uh, three analysts out of the hundred will get all five flips correct, okay? So my question is, is that an anomaly? In other words, is it an anomaly to find that three analysts uh, actually found all five flips correct? If you follow the theory, they say, well, yes, that's an anomaly. The problem is, is that they haven't looked at the possible universe of possible outcomes. Now, here's the key thing about the three analysts who got all five flips correct. Are they any better than the other 97 to get the sixth flip correct? And the answer is no. However, what you'll find is, you know, a lot of times you'll see TV shows and you'll have people come on and say, we should listen to him because he's been right for the last six months. And then three months later, we have somebody else and they'll say, uh, we should listen to him because he's been right the last four or five months. And I think one of the biggest problems we have in finance is people have a tendency to confuse, confuse ability with luck. Okay. In other words, when they, uh, things go well, they have champagne parties, and when things go wrong, like in 1929, they jump out of windows. Um, I, won't make the, I won't say anything about what the official market says about uh, um, Dukas uh Trader of the Month or Strategy of the Month uh, uh, um, concepts, but uh, that's an important point. Another thing we have is um, um, empirical studies have been done on specialists, okay? And uh, that's another interesting area. Speaking of these tests, I'd like to have a look at the case of Lushka the monkey. Lushka was given the task of choosing eight companies out of a possible 30 to invest her money in. She ended up with her choices outperforming 94% of the Russian investment funds with her own portfolio, 
What does this tell us? Well, there have been a lot of studies looking at um, professionals. And uh, these studies have looked at uh, corporate insiders, uh, stock exchange specialists, which are the brokers, and security analysts, and professional money managers. And the studies have basically found that the corporate insiders and the stock exchange specialists tended to possibly outperform the market, while they found that security analysts and prof professional money managers actually did not outperform the market. And this is where it led to the concept of what is called a monkey portfolio. And you're probably gonna ask, what is a monkey portfolio? The <laughs> idea is that you basically take a monkey and you have him throw darts at a board. Actually, not at a board, have him throw darts at uh, stock market pages. And he picks, that's the way we pick the stocks. And what they found is that, in general, the monkey portfolios have done at least better than 50% of the professional money managers. And in the case of Lushka, that's 98%. Okay. Well, this is important because then you have to ask yourself, why are you paying two or three percent extra to have your money managed professionally? And that's why we now see that a lot of um, pension funds and a lot of insurance companies are basically investing in index funds that have very low management fees. We're seeing that over, it used to be very small percentage, now almost 25 percent of all major money is managed through this concept of investing in index funds. Okay, that's an important thing. This leads us nicely into what Warren Buffett had to say. He says, the only value of stock forecasters is to make fortune tellers look good. Um, is this the case? Do we ever really have a good insight into the future of the market? Well, I think that I saw another one that says that you make more money by selling advice than by trading on this advice. Okay, so it follows very much into what Warren Buffett says. Um, let me turn my, the attention to uh, foreign exchange because it's very important for Dukas Copy TV. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, the foreign exchange market is probably the market where uh, the Fisher market hypothesis probably fits the best because you have so many, many traders, uh, so many people uh, involved in the foreign exchange market. And um, you, uh, I need to state what the, the efficient market hypothesis states that the best forecast, the best foreign exchange forecast, is the current spot rate. In other words, your forecast of what the exchange rate should be in a year from now is actually the current spot rate. In other words, if the price reflects all available information and the only thing that can move the price is unanticipated events, then the best forecast is going to be what it is today. Okay? And there have been a lot of studies that have tried to, um, to see if that's the case. For example, we've had empirical stats that have looked at the uh, forecasting ability of the forward exchange rate against the spot exchange rate. And basically, uh, the studies have said that the forward rate did not do a better job of forecasting the spot exchange rate in terms of a foreign exchange forecast. We also have studies that have looked at professional money managers, actually banks. And you would think banks would be in the better position to be able to forecast exchange rates since they have large trading departments. The empirical studies have basically shown that these professional money managers, these professional foreign exchange specialists, were not better at forecasting the exchange rate than what would be assumed under the efficient market hypothesis. The thing is, is about the efficient market hypothesis is that there are a lot of people in the finance industry who would love for it not to be true. Um, uh, the, and I, I can imagine that this, this uh, interview is going to cause a lot of controversy. The problem is, is that uh, it is one of the most important theories in finance, and it's very important that you understand it and understand its implications. As I said earlier, there is evidence against the efficient market hypothesis. Events such as the 1987 stock market crash, when the Dow Jones Industrial Average fell by 20% in a single day. This does show prices deviating from their fair values, something which the EMH says isn't possible. Does this mean a theory can be discounted if it doesn't apply at all times? Yes, um, a lot of people have used the dot-com bubble as an example, saying, well, this is proof of the efficient market hypothesis doesn't work. But if you assume that stock prices are um, 
the discounted present value of future dividends and those dividends are based on growth rates. You can have a very small change in the anticipated growth rate and it will have a significant impact on the market value of the particular stock that, that's of interest. So it's not really for me that isn't really a proof of against the the efficient market hypothesis, it just says that maybe there has been a change in the anticipated growth rates and dividend into the future. Finally, for all the FX traders watching this show now, would you advise going with EMH or sticking with the forecasts and predicted trends? Um, I think I'll fall back in, on what I said before, is that uh, the evidence has been more for the efficient market hypothesis than against. So uh, I would leave it at that. Thank you, Dr. Hollenbeck. Some interesting things for us all to consider there. And if FX trading is your thing, stay tuned to Duke Escopi TV for all the latest Forex news.